the way in which this war shapes a new stage in historical development of the region, and uh, I would say of the world as a whole, because we are a very different place today than we were after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Democracy has been in trouble. How many people were out there prepared to fight for it, to put their lives in risk, put their lives in line? That's what Ukrainians are doing. They're saying that they're fighting for freedom and democracy, and they mean it. They're not doing that to please the West. At one very important stage in the global development really came to an end with this war, and the new is just being formed. We, we don't know what it will be yet. Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. Today is one of my most important conversations as I chat with Serhii Ploky about the Ukrainian people's struggle against the Russian invasion. Serhii is a historian of Ukraine and is professor of history at Harvard University. He's had family members and friends killed during the fighting. So as well as his interest in his homeland's plight, it's personal for him too. Sir, he has written a book on that invasion, as well as Ukraine's independence and relationship with Russia. It's called the Russo-Ukrainian War. Coming up on the podcast, I've got Charles Spencer on Charles II, the greatest British commander of all time. That's not Charles II, by the way. As well as a chat on the Parthenon marble. So please do subscribe, rate and review. I'd be hugely grateful. In the meantime, I'm going to hand you over to me talking with Serhii Ploky on the war in Ukraine. Sehi Plocky, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for, for joining me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, I <clears throat> I was just saying before we, we started recording how I, I've literally just finished the book this morning. And it particularly reading the afterword is very moving because you've got family members and friends, of course, who are fighting and, and have lost their lives as well. So this book it was obviously very important as to why you wanted to write it just after the invasion happened back in February 22, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, that's that's where I, uh, after some hesitation, decided that I had uh, to write that book. And that was February, early April, when I started working on it, uh, not knowing, of course, what the, what, what the ultimate result would be. We still are in the middle of the war. It's uh, probably as far from over. Uh, but uh, what I tried to do in that book is um, try to figure out for myself and then explain to, to others, explain to the readers how we got into that war, what the war demonstrated already during the first months and then during the first year of the, of the hostilities. And uh, I think that despite the fact that the war is far from over, we see already a number of trends emerging in terms of the and can understand the way in which it changed not just Ukraine and Russia, but it changed the world. One of the first outcomes of the war is already also clear that Ukraine survived and will survive as an independent state. And that gave me some uh, confidence uh, in, in not just going on with the manuscript, but also finishing it. And I, I think that what the book has to offer is much more than just discussion, the way uh, how, how Russia, or Ukraine, the world got into that war, but also can provide some, uh, some answers about, about the future. Well, yes, I mean, it's laid out very clearly from... I mean, it, it, I guess technically it's a book of history, but as you say, you know, things are things are ongoing. So, so I guess current it's a bit of both current affairs and history. I mean, the first chapters deal with. Well, I, I wanted to start there. Really, is is a lot of a lot of listeners may know that Russia has always had sort of territorial intent when it comes to Ukraine, but why that is is probably less clear. I know, and and this goes back many hundreds of years as well. But it's a deep-seated, well, certainly with Putin and, and presumably with many people in Russia, but there's a deep-seated assumption, isn't there, that Russia should own Ukraine, as it were. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, what we see here on the one hand is a classic uh, war of the disintegration of the empire. Uh, the disintegration of the Russian empire started during World War I. Then the Bolsheviks stitched it together with a new type of ideology, a new type, of, new level of brutality. It uh, lasted uh, until the end of the Soviet Union in 91, and then a new stage of the disintegration of the empire was opened. And this war is the war that many observers expected to a degree at the end of the Soviet Union. It didn't happen, and it is happening now. So this is one level, the, the classic empire versus colony versus periphery versus the country that tries to break out from the imperial imperial embrace just want to mention that say sorry to interrupt you but do you, do you I, I was going to ask this but since you've mentioned it is this sort of the last kick of a of a dying empire well i i want it to be the last kick but i can't uh, th that's one of the questions that i maybe pose but i can't can't provide answer to that and the reason for that is that the uh, stories of the, the disintegration of the empire is not one act play. It's not an event. It is a process. And that process can take not just decades, sometimes uh, it can take centuries. I already talked about the disintegration of the Russian Empire and gave 1914 as the starting point. You can also think about the Ottomans. Their decline started in the 17th century, and the Balkan wars of the 1990s is still the, the wars over re reformatting of the place that was left by the Ottoman Empire on the one hand, Habsburgs on the other. So I really want it to be the last kick. I really want it to be the last act in the drama of the disintegration of the Russian Empire. I am not sure whether it, it, it would be, but I have no doubt that this is a major, major event in, in that story. It's a major event in the process of the reimagining, not just of Ukraine, but also of Russia as a post-imperial state. Right. And so going back to my earlier question around the sort of historical reasons as to why the Russians have gone in. That is uh, that is a story that uh, is is imperial, but also a little bit different from other empires. Britain, of course, had had enormous em empire. But no one in London imagined that the origins of England or Britain were really somewhere in Delhi. Or in India, but this is this is the case uh, with the with the Russian Empire. The till today, uh, the majority probably of Russians believe that the origins of Russia, not as an empire but as a nation, are in Kiev. Uh, that's a very very uh, prominent, very powerful historical myth in Russia about their origins from Kiev, from the medieval state called Kiev and Rus, and that's also partially a foundation for Putin's claims that Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people. That's that's how you claim Kiev, and that's how you claim Kievan legacy. After the annexation of Crimea, they built a huge statue to Prince Volodymyr, who is a namesake of Vladimir Putin. And of course, Prince Volodymyr was prince in Kiev, not in Moscow. But his largest statue is today in Moscow. So there is there is imperial part of the story. And then there is uh, uh, ethno-national Russian identity that is closely connected and linked to, to a different country, which makes things uh, more complicated and, and, uh, and uh, bizarre at the same time. So one of the reasons why the Russian, uh, the Russian war uh, went so wrong was that uh, completely misreading of history, misunderstanding of today's Ukraine, expectation that uh, uh, the Ukrainians who allegedly were really Russians would welcome uh, Russian troops with flowers and they welcomed them with uh, stingers and, 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 and other weapons. Uh, so uh, history is is written all over this this war from the uh, way how Putin imagined uh, uh, or reimagined Russian imperial history uh, to uh, the way in which this war shapes a new stage in in, in historical development of the region and uh, I would say of the world as a whole because we are 
we are in a very different place today than we were after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, one very important stage in the global development really came to an end with this war and the new is, is just being, being formed. Uh, formed. We, we don't know what it will be yet. Well, there's a view by some, and I don't share this, but there are some who feel that the reason for the, the invasion is NATO expansion. And, and that's the reason for the Russian invasion. That's not the case. You don't agree with that either. Mm, I, I don't agree with that. And, and I provide a number of explanations in, in the book why uh, I don't think that that was the case. But here I just mentioned one. And uh, the, the war produced produced results that, of course, Russia didn't expect. One of them was Finland joining NATO and Sweden breaking with more than 200 years of neutrality and is about to join NATO. And this is also new development in comparison to the Cold War history. So if NATO would be a real threat, and if NATO would be of real concern for Russia, what uh, what you would see today is every single Russian soldier living in Ukraine and being moved to the border with Finland, because by Finland joining NATO, the Russian border with NATO was doubled. But I am still waiting for evidence of at least one soldier or one officer being withdrawn from Ukraine and moved to the border with Finland. And what that suggests to me that NATO was a pretext. The real the the the, the real reason for the war is really deeply deeply rooted into history, imperial history of Russia, and also of this uh, confusion about about Russian identity, really dedication to historical mythology about the origins of Russia, and and Russia coming ca- coming from Kiev. So I put much more emphasis on on this bad history than on concern about NATO. I'm not trying to say that Putin was particularly happy about expansion of NATO, but I I don't see, I, I, I can't really make a credible argument that that was a decisive decisive factor. And what happened after the start of the war just confirms it. Well, one event that happened a few months before the start of the war was the American withdrawal in Afghanistan. Do you think that encouraged Putin? I mean, he was always presumably intent on continuing his his war in in, um, Ukraine, because, of course, as we know, it started 2014, really. But do you think the withdrawal meant that that was a sort of almost a green light for, for Putin? Uh, well, th- that's certainly, I would say, an encouraging an, an encouraging factor, uh, because um, U.S. really, uh, in his mind, demonstrated uh, absolute uh, absolute incompetence in, in dealing with the international issues and matters. Things don't go right; they withdraw, and uh, he certainly expected the same sort of a behavior this time around. Uh, not just from the United States, but from the from the Western community community as a whole, and uh, uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan and the way how the army, the Afghan army that was trained by by the United States and allies, supplied and resupplied again and again, how it disappeared overnight, that certainly didn't didn't uh, add um, confidence to the American and Western intelligence services and politicians with regard to the ability of Ukrainian army to fight back. Uh, everyone was concerned about uh, Russian army. Everyone was afraid of Russia. So to imagine that Ukraine would fight back and would fight back not just as small partisan groups, here and there, but the, the armed forces would be able to withstand the attack and then go on the counteroffensive. That was difficult to imagine, and partially also because of the experience of Afghanistan. And I was, I mean, this comes across in the book, but I wondered if you could just speak a, a bit about it, because here in the West, we see a lot of Zelensky, and he's, you know, a huge hero now, which might give rise to the idea that he's a a major factor as to why Ukraine fought back. But really, it's the Ukrainian people and that sense of identity that is the the real 
reason. And I don't want to downplay Zelensky's um, role either. Yeah, I, I, I exactly agree with that with that nuanced analysis of yours. Uh, Zelensky, Zelensky is an important uh, figure, and and the way how he handled himself and situation is is very important. Again, speaking about the Afghanistan, the president there fled. That that's again something that everyone expected. Zelensky, as we know, was offered to to um, set up a government in exile, either in Warsaw or in London. And, and he refused to do that. So we, we can downplay Zelensky. But Zelensky, in my in my reading, uh, is really an amplifier. So his talent as a politician comes from his experience as an actor. He, he can read the audience. He understands the audience. And uh, or, or, or public or, or his country. And uh, the the decision to fight and the spirit uh, really comes from from the Ukrainian people, comes in in that context, quote unquote, from the audience that that, that he is on the stage, he is he, he he is reacting to to what is happening in the in the in the room. Um, um, at no point, uh, Ukraine, uh, the, the um, Poland showed that the uh, number of Ukrainians who believed in victory fell below 75%. I would give uh, Zelensky and his leadership anywhere between 15 and 20% in that 75 to 80%. But uh, the rest, 60 or, or, or 55 the, the controlling package really, really belongs to the Ukrainian people. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And the Donbass and Crimea, which fell in, in 2014, it was so interesting reading the book, which I hadn't, I guess I hadn't realised back in the early 90s. Is it 91, I think, when the referendum for independence for Ukraine in those two regions, we're led to believe that there's a strong Russian uh, identity but the percentage, I think Crimea was 54% in favor of independence and the Donbass much higher, eight, over 80%. Over 80%, yes. And th- and that's not really mentioned when because we assume that um, the Donbass and Crimea are quote-unquote Russian. I mean, that that's clearly not the case, is it? Uh, yes, if uh, uh, that that would be the case, we would have a so-called referendum in the Crimea in 2014 being opened to international observers and independent observers. We would also have a referendum that was not taking place under the military control and the conditions of the military takeover. So while not saying that there were no percentage of the population in, in the Crimea that probably welcomed the, the uh, Russian takeover of the peninsula. Uh, nothing that we have suggests that there was basically um, uh, over 50%. Otherwise, we would see a very different referendum. And when it comes to Donbass, where the vote for independence was over 80%, uh, there, there was a military takeover and hybrid warfare. The leaders of the so of the puppet states that were created by Moscow were parachuted from from uh, Moscow as well. I, I discussed that the so-called Minister of Defense of the Donetsk Republic was a former FSB officer, Mr. Strelkov. Uh, Gherkin, his his real name, and the prime minister was Mr. Borodai, a, a political uh, a so, sort of spin doctor and political consultant, uh, also coming from Moscow. Um, that's 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 an indication that, uh, or one more indication that uh, what what happened in Donbas was also part of the of the military takeover uh, by by Russia by Russian Federation. Um, Ukraine turned out to be completely, completely unprepared for for that sort of scenario back in 2014. There was a change of the government as the result of the revolution of dignity of 2014. And um, I want to say that Ukrainians, Ukrainian society, Ukrainian government certainly drew lessons from 2014. So when Putin came back, there was no any more uh, illusions on what that meant. Uh, 
there there were uh, people with Ukrainian flags marching against the Russian tanks. We saw that on TV. We have a clear evidence of that. So the war that started in 2014 really transformed Ukraine. And uh, one of Putin's <clears throat> big mistakes was that invading Ukraine in 2022, he believed that uh, it was still largely Ukraine of 2014, and it wasn't. I remember reading a, a report that I think, I, I, I read it at RUSI, the Royal United States Institute. There was a poll that the KGB, I think, had commissioned. I'm, I may have got this wrong, but it seemed to suggest if you'd read read the sort of summary report, it claimed there is a strong uh, kinship between the Ukraine and Russia, which I guess no one would really deny pr prior to the um, prior to the invasion. But if you delved into sort of beyond the summary, it showed a, a really powerful Ukrainian identity. And it seems extraordinary to me that a Russia, you know, the, the KG or the FSB, I should I should call it, uh, the FSB would not read their own report. I'm uh, at the same time surprised and not surprised. Um, I, I'm surprised because the the leader of Russia is uh, is coming from that uh, from that world from FSB world and is supposed to know better. Uh, but I'm not surprised, given that really Russia today is a, um, authoritarian regime, and even in democratic regimes, the uh, uh, intelligence services. Maybe not always, but at least occasionally, bring to the boss only the news that boss wants to to get and to hear, and uh, that that certainly happened. That that certainly happened in in Russia. I, I have no doubt in that regard. And and Putin's uh, Putin's thinking was was really much influenced by his thinking about his legacy, which he uh, understood in very imperial terms, Russian imperial terms of gathering or gathering the lands of the former Russian empire in, in one form or another, not exactly in the form of the Soviet Union, not exactly in the form of the Russian empire, but certainly extending the Russian sphere of influence to the former imperial space. And uh, then everything else was there to ju just to, to please the leader. We, we saw the televised meeting of the Russian Security Council where and the decision, really decision go to war was made. And the, the, the body language, what was presided in there were made very clear. It was basically a, a court of the czar with with really the, the rest of them trying to guess what what he wanted what what his thoughts were and then try to 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 play uh, to play accordingly so so if we look at the rise then of putin who uh, yeah as you say i guess he's effect, he's effectively the czar today in the uh, in the 90s boris yeltsin uh, reading the book Yeltsin is very much seen, I, th I would say, by many here in the West as being responsible for Putin. And so Yeltsin's leadership of the Russian Federation in, in that period was therefore a complete disaster. But we should be thankful to Yeltsin in some ways. He used authoritarian methods to bring about democracy or a form of democracy. Yes, yes, certainly he tried to do that and he failed. Uh, because once you once you create an authoritarian state with the goal of bringing democracy, uh, the the uh, authoritarian state really crushes that democracy. So you can't you can't get to democracy through through authoritarianism. You can get to the market economy through authoritarianism. We now know that we look we look at China. We look at, at uh, in other places. But one thing where uh, autocracy doesn't bring you, it doesn't bring you uh, to, to, to democracy. And um, um, everyone applauded uh, Yeltsin back in the 1970s <clears throat> when he uh, ordered his tanks to fire at the, at the Russian parliament and then rewrote constitution because, of course, the people who rebelled against him were former communists and nationalists and, and he was a democratically elected leader. But he created a constitution that then provided all the instruments necessary for the creation of a really authoritarian regime by his successor, who was 
was Vladimir Putin. So it's not just the matter of getting it wrong and selecting the wrong person for the for the uh, position and then manipulating the system of the democratic elections, which were not democratic. But the big, big issue is uh, uh, the, the the creation, really, foundations for Russian authoritarianism by the most democratic of the Russian leaders of the 20th century. Putin himself, we've seen with the last year's invasion and then 2014, of course, the first invasion. And then we have Georgia in 2008. Had Ukraine fallen, I mean, it's a bit of a what if, I know, but if Ukraine had fallen, I was speaking to a Polish historian who is convinced that the Russians view Poland as similar in a similar way to maybe, I don't know, the Baltics, that they should belong to the wider sort of Russian empire. Do you think it would have been a domino effect and Putin would have waited a little bit longer and then maybe looked at the Baltics and Poland? Uh, I have no doubt that uh, Baltics could very well be his next target. Um, certainly Moldova, there is no question about that, but Baltics as well. Uh, because despite Baltics being in the uh, European Union and being part of NATO, the thinking is still very much imperial and and soviet or post-soviet uh, in moscow baltics are still viewed as part of the uh, of the moscow sphere of influence at least they should be brought back under under the the uh, influence of moscow um i uh, think that if if baltics would would follow then there would be more encouragement of course to to, to think about poland as well so i don't think that that would be happening around the same time uh, but the, the uh, importance of Ukraine is in the fact that it's not only about Ukraine. It is about the post-Soviet space in general. The Soviet Union fell apart in 1991 on the issue of Ukraine, on the issue of Ukrainian referendum. Um, no one in Russia believed that it made sense to continue with the Soviet experiment without the second largest post-Soviet republic. And uh, any Russian plans on reintegration of the post-Soviet space and post-imperial space also turned out to be dependent on Ukraine. That's why we have the war that we have today, partially because it's not just about Ukraine, it's about the uh, Russian uh, post-Soviet -post role in the region. And uh, the war, you you you're absolutely correct, uh, stating that it didn't didn't begin in February of 2022. It, it started in February of 2014. The the key issue over which the war started was um, um, Ukraine's desire to sign association agreement with European Union. Over that, the Orange Revolution took place. The new government committed itself doing that. So it wasn't membership in NATO, it wasn't membership in European Union. But the trick was that once Ukraine signs that agreement and it eventually signed, it couldn't join any other um, similar, similar bloc, trading bloc or any other bloc. And that meant a major blow to Russian plans to recreate, recreate Moscow's control over the post-Soviet space in the form of so-called Eurasian Union. So um, signing that association agreement, Ukraine would be out, was out, and uh, then the, the, the war is, again, started in 2014. The, this latest stage is continuation of the same war, but the trigger was an attempt of Ukraine to break out from the Russian sphere of influence. So then when the Russians first went in in 2014 then, there's virtually no response from the West or none to really speak of. How does that make, I mean, you're Ukrainian. This must be a huge lesson for, for Ukrainians not to trust the West. Um, certainly there was, there was a lot of, a, a lot of uh, disappointment. And uh, after 20, after the takeover of the Crimea, uh, some sanctions were introduced uh, but uh, the, the real trigger became not so much the Crimea, but the shooting down of the Malaysian airplane with a lot of citizens of European Union. 
So to, to a degree, sanctions, sanctions, really the turning point in the decision to introduce sanctions was about the um, tragedy that involved Europeans. Not, first and second, the tragedy that, that affected, affected the Ukrainians. Um, generally, there was there was certainly a, a, a policy that is is difficult really to characterize in any other way but appeasement. After uh, the Russian war against Georgia, uh, Germany they make decision to start Nord Stream One. After the annexation of the Crimea, there would be Nord Stream Two. Um, and uh, uh, the the Ukraine certainly got got uh, a lot of support, but certainly not enough support. Um, Ukraine of 2022 had a much more capable army than in 2014, thanks to the to the American and Western Western support. Sanctions also also uh, helped to a degree, but all of that were so to say half measures. I am personally convinced that if the response to the aggression against Georgia would be at least half of what the response is today to 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 this uh, to, to to the current stage of the war, if the response to 2014 would be at least half of what they were in 2022, we would not have that escalation because the the um, appeasement and we, we know that from the history of the 1930s just whets the appetite of the aggressor and we we we, we fell into the same into the same trap again mm. turning back to the donbass and, and crimea some experts say that the donbass and crimea are I guess they're speaking from a military standpoint, too difficult to reclaim. But I think the Ukrainian army is showing that's not necessarily the case. But if we look to how things can end, having read your book, I can't see how Ukraine would want to give up the Donbass or, or Crimea. Um, well, uh, I really can't imagine <clears throat> um, any any of the politicians who suggest that Ukraine give up territory um, uh, really, really expecting from the, the governments, the governments in, in European Union, any government so whatsoever, uh, conducting war and saying that, okay, we really don't want, we don't mean it. <laughs> We are fighting, but we are we are okay with with part of our territory be, being taken over. Yes, we are fighting, but yeah, who cares about about uh, uh, um, territorial integrity or sovereignty? That, that that principle doesn't mean to us. And when it comes to the West, it looks like just a, a, an old imperial uh, imperial um, uh, sort of um, uh, thinking that okay, the 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 the, the newer countries they they certainly don't live by uh, by our standards. <laughs> it's it's okay for for Zelensky to go out there and say that uh, no, we are we we are not going back to the borders of 1991. They ne would never imagine that about themselves. They would never imagine that about the the older the the older uh, more established states. So there is a sort of colonialism. Uh, and colonial discourse or expectations coming not only from Russia but also but also from the West. So, uh, well, in, in reality, wherever war ends in terms of the of the um, borders, uh, for, for Ukrainians to to say anything else, to fight in for anything else, would be would demonstrate their really immaturity as a, as a, as a nation, as a modern nation, and and they're maturing very fast. So I would suggest to to everyone who engages in that so, sort of rhetoric, just drop it. And um, with regard to the to the military aspect of the story, not political, not 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 rhetorical. Um, I'm I'm not military expert, so it's difficult for me to say what is what is uh, um, militarily easier to achieve, what is what is more difficult to achieve. What I can say that Ukrainians actually surprise us again and again in this war. There were already three very effective counteroffensive. 
each of them were conducted under different different uh, circumstances. One, the battle for Kiev that was won by Ukraine, pushed the Russians out of the wooded areas of northern Ukraine. The the counteroffensive in Kharkiv in the east was conducted uh, in, in a different way, in a different manner, and then. The in the south, Ukraine, uh, the Russians were pushed from the right bank of of Dnieper and uh, had to leave Kherson, the only the only uh, regional center that they ever captured, and that they actually hastened to 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 include into the Russian territory and change the constitution. Um, so uh, we don't know how the counteroffensive in in the south or in the east that everyone talks about today will end. But there is, uh, Ukrainians have already a track record of uh, launching successful counteroffensive, using different tactics, doing that uh, uh, under different circumstances. So um, uh, again, I'm not a military expert. I can't, I can't really answer that question, but I wouldn't be surprised if Ukrainians surprised us once again in that, in, in that positive way. I guess I, I now have a question which feels a bit strange to ask a historian because I'm going to ask you a question about, I guess, the future. But and I think you've hinted at this in our, in our conversation or you've mentioned this in the conversation is that we should be very grateful to Ukraine for the fight that they're putting up because there are other countries, there are other nations around the world that are threatened. I mean, I, I, I guess we've mentioned the Baltics and Moldova, but I mean, even Taiwan, this is an important fight that's going on now for places like Taiwan? Uh, indeed, indeed, because uh, uh, victory for Ukraine means uh, really victory for the uh, principle of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries in general, no matter where they are. And uh, victory for Russia means uh, victory for the, uh, for the great powers uh, really right to, to violate territorial integrity, to violate the principle of sovereignty anywhere in the world. And uh, so far, we, what we saw in the world since, since really the, the uh, great, uh, great recession and then through COVID, uh, rise of the um, populism, rise of authoritarian tendencies, even in democratic countries and including in, in, in including uh, United States so you you think about populism again this is not just Europe we can talk about UK as well uh, and uh, uh, really really the the, the principles of um, democracy and broadly speaking international law were in retreat the, the authoritarian great powers were on the rise and served as a model for some of the allegedly democratic leaders in the in, in the West. Uh, so on on the outcome of the war in Ukraine depends not just the future of the post-Soviet space, but as uh, you're absolutely right to talk about China, to talk about Taiwan. Um, uh, on, depends depends really the 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 future of the. Um, democracy and th that sounds like an overstatement but i'm just thinking about that again maybe it sounds like overstatement but that's that's what i believe is really happening because democracy has been in trouble how many people were out there prepared to fight for it to 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 uh, put their lives in risk put their lives online that's that's what ukrainians are doing they're saying that they're fighting for for freedom and democracy and they, they they mean it. They're not doing that to please the West and to get to get uh, more armaments. Zelensky is doing that very well without <laughs> without using that sort of language. So th that's that's what Ukrainians believe in. And the the the, the nation that uh, resists Russian aggression is a, a sort of a nation that you can read about in textbooks is a political nation that uh, is is bilingual. The war on the Ukrainian side fought in, in, in two languages, as much in Russian as is in Ukrainian. It's a nation that that uh, uh, really the, the builds unity, but by crossing ethnic lines and religious lines. The only nation in the world outside of Israel that is led by the president of Jewish background, uh, 
so um, yes, they, 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 I, I certainly believe Ukrainians when they're si saying that they're fighting for, for uh, freedom, for, for, for democracy, for the principles of democracy. Um, so this is, this is very important globally. Yeah, I don't think it can be overstated how significant because we're in a world, a new world now, and and it, yeah, as you say, a fight for democracy. Yes, yes, yes. So he, that has been wonderful to speak to you. Thank you very much, and I wish you every success with the book, which I think has come out. Is it today? Well, uh, it was released uh, uh, on uh, May sixteenth. Sixteenth, I didn't. Know. Yeah, so it's so it is three three days old, or maybe two and a half days old. So th thank you very much. I really, I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss this book with you. Well, I wish you every success with it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Oliver. Thank you very much for listening. I do hope you enjoyed that. I certainly found it enlightening myself. Coming up, I've got Charles Spencer, the Parthenon Marbles, and the greatest British commander. But until then, thank you, and good night. Mm -hmm.